Mayor Curry join us and, and pleased to have him here. We know that uh, Mr. Howard and Ms. Kessler are, are, are in, en route and <laughs> entering stage, stage right or left. <laughs> And we want to be respectful of the, the mayor's time. He's been, he's got such an uh, unbelievable schedule. How he keeps up with it is beyond me, but uh, he's been able to carve out a few moments to, to speak with us this morning. And I, I thought, uh, Mayor Curry, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. And members of the board. Good morning. Uh, first, uh, state the obvious. This was a historic storm. Uh, and. Uh, we prepared our people, we prepared our city, uh, over 250,000 people without power, and uh, the effort in seven days, uh, frankly, the effort and the results uh, are commendable. Uh, so to the organization, to the men and women on the ground, uh, they got that done. Uh, that is, I mean, that's good work, uh, and frankly, in unforeseen circumstances. Uh, that said, we can always do better. And, uh, you know, I would just, I would, I would ask management to, before the next storm season, to come up with a plan, get with the board and work with the board on uh, the way that customers are interacted with in a crisis, specifically communicated with, uh, given the information that you have. Uh, as you know, we set up a splash page to, so we could reconcile what the information you were getting and there was just a number of stories, example where uh, somebody gets an email that says their power's back on, checks out of a hotel, takes their family back home, no power, calls in, says, okay, we'll get it restored, leaves, goes somewhere with air conditioning, gets a phone call a couple of hours later, goes home, there's still no power. So we've all been in business. Uh, we know that uh, we have to, our customers have to know what to expect, and we have to have good information to communicate with them. So, again, the... 250,000 plus power outages, I mean, <laughs> your men and women did it. So the organization should be, be very proud of that. But again, I would just ask the management get with the board before the next storm season and as early as possible and understand why information was coming in that wasn't accurate and why customers didn't get accurate feedback so we can um, correct that and, and as we go forward. We'll do. All right. We'll do. Thank you for thank you. affording me the opportunity to be here. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be with us. And we'll certainly take your comments to heart. You're right. We learn something every time. Just because we did a good job this time doesn't mean we couldn't do better next time. And uh, certainly uh, easy for the board to sit up here, but the real credit goes to the uh, boots on the ground uh, that work so hard to get all of our customers back online uh, within one week and, and way ahead of our competitors uh, in the state, uh, I might note. So uh, kudos to all those people out on the ground. We will hold management accountable uh, for those information lapses in communication uh, to our customers and make sure that we do a better job next time. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You guys have a good day. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, we, you want to make sure you take your hat when you said volunteer. You're hardly a volunteer. That's <laughs> <laughs> my second hat in a week. <laughs> take your hat, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, ready to call the meeting to order. Turn it uh, to Mr. McElroy for a safety briefing. Safety briefing. We are on the eighth floor, so it's a little bit different than our normal uh, uh, meeting room on the 19th. Still the same same structure. We will exit the stairs, which uh, continue to be to the left of the elevators. We will uh, walk down, holding the handrail all the way down safely and orderly. Exiting out onto the plaza, we will join uh, together as a group after ca carefully crossing the streets, so Main Street and Church Street, and we'll be on the southeast corner in the open parking lot there, gathered together. Safety buddy, uh, take care of the person on your right. Make sure they get out with you, too. Um, we uh, have uh, Mike Brost and Ted Hobson will uh, take care of CPR and calling 911 and security should we have to. Thank, Thank you, Mr. McElroy. As you can tell from today's agenda, we have uh, deferred the actions that were originally proposed for our September meeting uh, until a later date. Given the catastrophic impact of Hurricane Irma, uh, we've asked management instead to report to the board uh, with an update on uh, storm remediation 
uh, what happened, what we can do better. Uh, preliminary report. Mr. McElroy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this truly is a preliminary report. I'll have a couple of remarks to start off, but the structure of the report will be our uh, incident command uh, 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 twice a day briefing. And so it's almost as if we'll be briefing the board. We've given you the documentation that we go through in our process every 12 hours, uh, ensuring that we've got the pre proper resources allocated and uh, positioned uh, to, to deal with uh, storm restoration. So let me start a little bit in terms of the storm, uh, pre-storm. We had a plan um, and we started the week before the storm. Uh, we started staging um, and quite frankly we were looking at and had a full range of staging opportunities being evaluated both in terms of what we actually deployed, but uh, we were looking in, in the event of a much worse uh, storm, uh, which was potentially um, uh, forecasted. So we, we set up three staging areas, our, our two service centers, south side and west side, as well as the Morocco Shrine. But as a, but, but as a secondary or a backstop there, we also secured uh, base camp staging uh, at Cecil Field and and also at Camp Landing under the direction of the state of Camp Landing. And that was to, in the event that we had to set up a temporary base camp uh, to, to house 500 individuals uh, in the event of catastrophic uh, destruction. We brought in over 350 individuals, uh, uh, linemen and, and tree um, um, removal um, uh, workforce. Uh, before the storm and position them here in order to be able to go to work immediately. Uh, we set up uh, uh, our systems were on high alert, uh, preparing uh, uh, both in terms of the last uh, several days what they could do to, to harden, put uh, material away and, and make sure that they were best able to ride out the storm. We double checked and ensured that we had the resources, I mentioned the, man, the manpower uh, workforce, uh, but also assets uh, in terms of uh, 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 linemen, uh, bucket trucks, uh, uh, material, fuel, all of those checked out. And we formally declared a, uh, an emergency status, uh, which is significant meaning on Friday evening at September 8th. So we immediately set up our command structure Mr. Hobson will give an overview of, of that structure. During the storm, a couple things happened. We lost this building. Uh, so any thoughts that we would be able to use this building? We were able to keep the, uh, the critical uh, communication uh, and infrastructure that's, uh, that's housed here and computer and IT infrastructure alive. But the building, uh, lost, we lost part of the roof, and that's why we're in this, this at the eighth floor right now. 19 is still under repair. We're contracting now to look at pr uh, repair of the roof. Um, so the building was, was lost uh, for utilization during the storm. Um, the storm itself was, uh, was a monster. It was, it was uh, 7.9 million people were out of power at the peak in a five-state area. In order to provide restoration, there were 59,000 utility workers put to, put to work to restore power to the 7.9 million in a five-state area. Florida certainly was the, the, uh, had, the, had the most um, damage um, and certainly the most catastrophic damage when we looked at the peninsula. So it came right up and covered the entire peninsula. There was destruction reported in all 67 counties of the storm. Why that is important is that during restoration, uh, we normally in the utility industry call on other parts of the country, other parts of the region to help us. To storms by their historical nature are somewhat regional, regional in that it might be a, a two county, five county, 20 county area, but you can count on the rest of the area to come in and help. In this case, immediately on the heels of Harvey, where resources were tired and already deployed in the Texas region, Texas, Louisiana region, uh, the national infrastructure, and I do mean national infrastructure for restoration, was stressed, and and so we, uh, our team, uh, uh, made the call to get get assets in here before our storm because we were certainly aware that it was going to be a challenge after the storm to get folks. That was a that was a great decision they made. Uh, when we set up uh, in the restoration, we set up we're, we're going to try to keep pace. Our objective was to try to keep pace with the rest of the state in restoration. Now, recognize that we were we started six to 12 hours behind the rest of the state because the storm entered on the northern border. Um, we did that uh, extremely well, and I think you'll hear that in terms of our restoration uh, process, and that is a tribute to the men and women 
uh, that we're we're managing dispatching planning and then ultimately the the linemen are fantastic crews uh, as as well as the tree maintenance and all of the mutual aid and contract uh, employ uh, workers that we brought in just did a phenomenal job and you're he you'll hear a good story on safety as well we early uh, uh, set as a team objective was that we were not going to push uh, there was not going to be any sense of push or urgency on restoration coming out of our our uh, command center it's dangerous work it's work done in an, in an unstable environment and if you push somebody in that unstable dangerous environment somebody gets hurt and somebody can die and so we we stayed true to the call we were going to bring in as much as we could uh, in terms of the way of resources to apply that to the challenge of restoration but those that were engaged in the restoration were going to work safely and they did a phenomenal job I think I'll sum up in a, and because we'll get a comprehensive review here each each group has a, about a five minute in terms of their um, um, piece in the restoration and, and working on our our emergency management team but I, I just have to say thank you to our customers who showed extraordinary patience um, and 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 quite frankly you'll hear kindness uh, and support for our team and from the bottom of my heart I say thank you to them I want to thank the mayor who certainly prepared our, our community and the council who supported uh, supported him every step of the way from the state perspective we tied in every day uh, during the peak of the storm a couple times a day and and most recently every day with the governor and his staff they were extraordinarily helpful in identifying resources for the state and then reallocating resources once they freed up as as we did and let go of some of ours in the last couple of days to help other parts of the state EOC's both here and in the state level did extraordinary work uh, our um, utilities that came in under mutual aid agreement uh, we had eight eight or nine utilities that came in from all across the country to support us our contract workers uh, JTA who set up a, a mini uh, city transit system for us to move the over 800 workers around from hotels to work sites on a daily basis the extraordinary JEA team uh, did a phenomenal job and again to our customers for their patient uh, kindness and support and with that mr. chairman I would turn this over to mr. Hobson who who uh, Ted Hobson uh, in the command structure, I operate as inc uh, incident command, uh, incident commander. Uh, Ted is uh, the backup, and we got down to the point there where we both need a little rest. And in the last couple of days, we've been rotating, and that's the way the structure's set up. So we're side by side <coughs> during the storm. But in the last uh, last 36 hours, we we each stepped out and managed to get some six or seven hours of, of recharging the battery a little bit here. And that what and that's what would happen. Um, that's what that's what would happen in terms of uh, if this went on longer the system set up so rotation so we've got a good backup and you can stay fresh and continue to sustain any level of recovery yeah. thank you I have passed out a chart which describes the uh, the incident command structure that we use J at JEA this is based on and in fact in full compliance with the uh, <coughs> national incident management system that was selected by FEMA seven or eight years ago as the required structure for managing um, emergencies, uh, particularly if you're an agency that can claim reimbursement from FEMA, then you must organize your effort in, in, uh, in alignment with the National Incident Management System. So that's, that's what we've done. Uh, so if we just look at the chart, we start out with the incident command structure, and as Paula's just told you, there's three of us that do that. In a really long event that would run past weeks, then we would rotate. We found uh, what we have kind of found works best here at JEA for it for a week or shorter. We 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 overlap a lot, and basically uh, those of us in that box just stay in the command center uh, the entire time uh, for several days. Once it gets past several days, maybe a week, then we need to start rotating out. We did that this time right towards the end. At some point, you need to get. A little more normal sleep pattern and, and you don't perform at optimum if you do that too long but we overlapped very much during this storm so you see how the incident command structure works and then you've got the senior leadership team all of them rep, all of whom is represented here at this table which uh, monitors and and um, basically consults with uh, all the other um, all the other uh, managers there and team members 
uh, for the incident command structure. Then you see reporting directly to the incident commander are the liaison officers with the other counties and with the city of Jacksonville. Also the safety officer, the agency liaison, you know Nancy and, and Jordan, uh, and then the public information officer all work directly with the incident commander and with the SLT. So the colored boxes then down below are the functional operations areas. So you've got uh, environmental, uh, human resources, water, wastewater, electric, which was a big one as long as well as water, wastewater in, in this event, uh, operations section, ser uh, technology services, a big player in, in, in every effort, and then uh, customer experience. And then uh, we have a planning section, a logistics section, and a finance section, and you can see the subsections that belong to those down there. But again, everyone in a colored box is either, either the person named or one of the three that are named for rotation are at the EOC at all times. We meet uh, twice a day officially, six in the morning and six in the evening, where we review the results from today and plan results for the next day. We fill out an incident action plan, which, which basically documents the accomplishments and the issues for the past 24 hours and plans the objectives for the next 24 hours. Um, so that, that's pretty much the structure. The SLT typically meets just before or just after the uh, operations, uh, the EOC meeting. Uh, sometimes we found it, uh, it, it is an advantage to meet before, so we've got all the data, and if there's any significant decisions to be made and communicated, we can do that in the SLT structure and then communicate those at, the, at one of the two meetings. Sometimes we learn information in the uh, debriefings at 6 and 6 that we as an SLT and an incident command team need to talk about. So sometimes we meet before, sometimes afterwards, sometimes before and after. Uh, so that worked very well for us. It's a forced uh, organizational structure. You will note that many of the names on this chart are outside of their normal daily uh, responsibilities. So this is what we call our gray sky responsibilities. Uh, you know, blue sky of the compliance manager. But uh, when we have an incident, then I'm an incident commander. And most of the other folks here can say the same thing. So that's basically, that's basically the structure. That's how we organized, how we function. We have learned uh, through the last several events to work with this structure, to leverage it, to, to get the, uh, accomplish the objectives that we set, which is restoration, in this case, restoration of all electric service as fast as we can do it safely and monitor and, um, and operate on the water and wastewater system so that we don't have incidents with respect to those. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bros. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman, members of the board. The, uh, as, just to reinforce the point, the uh, storm response plans for electric have evolved and improved over the years. What we did for Irma was different and better than what we did for, for Matthew, and we'll continue to, to improve moving forward. Um, as uh, as Paul indicated, the plan is three parts. There's a pre-storm part, which is really pretty simple. The trick is trying to figure out how many non jd resources we want to bring in and pre-stage, pre pre-deploy. Um, uh, there's the ride out. Uh, this team rode out the storm downtown along with uh, over 500 other individuals. Uh, our plants remained uh, manned and, and operating. Uh, and then you move into the hard part, which is the post-storm. Uh, that began for us on Monday. Uh, although we really couldn't get out and do a whole lot of work early, if you recall, the wind was blowing quite hard during the day, and we got out as we could. Uh, it was probably 3 o'clock before we got fully deployed on Monday. Post-storm is two parts. It's pretty simple. We assess the damage, and we restore power. Uh, we, we did our initial damage assessment of our entire electric system in 24 hours. That includes the distribution system, and, and for that, we used a new tool. We used a tablet-based uh, app, a, a GIS-oriented application to document the damage quickly. Uh, we put that in place and trained on it literally uh, days before uh, before we got hit my room. So brand new, didn't have it for Matthew, used it for, uh, for Irma, it did work really, really well. And that was used for the distribution system. We also uh, had uh, our generation plants were assessed, our transmission system was assessed, all of our substations, uh, 100 substations were assessed. We used uh, drones for the first time. In fact, we had some video of it up over there. Uh, we brought in a helicopter. We experienced uh, significant damage, of course, on the distribution system, all, uh, all tree-related. <clears throat> we lost uh, 16 transmission lines. Now, our transmission network is redundant, so it didn't, we didn't have any lo loss of load from those outages. All tree-related. 
Uh, no wire on the ground for the higher voltage transmission, no uh, tower pole structure issues, uh, simply a, 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 a tree down the line, tripped it out. We had to go out, it took us a couple days to go find all those and clean them up and fix them and restore the transmission system. Uh, we lost Northside 3 is our only generator during the, uh, during the storm. The generator itself is fine. It's the, tr it's the associated transmission asset in the substation that was damaged by the wind. Uh, all, of the, all of the damage other than that and some flooding issues downtown, all of our outages were tree related. Uh, the wind did not knock any of our distribution assets down. The, the, the system is strong and resilient and stood up to the, to the wind. It's, uh, it was all tree, uh, tree related. Uh, on our TND system, and uh, one wind event at Northside on a, on a substation structure, and the flooding downtown, which we're all very aware of, affected us out of our Water Street downtown substation. Uh, the power restoration. Uh, our guys don't sit around and wait on the damage assessment. They have pre-assigned responsibilities. We have over 700 priority uh, service locations. It's, it's in five levels. We've got priority one group, priority two, three, four, five. It includes uh, military bases, uh, public safety, hospitals, shelters. Um, moving down the list, there's some high community impact things we go after, like we, we try to get the intersections, the major intersections working, which also picks up a lot of the, the grocery stores and the, and, the, and the targets and the Walmarts so that people have, uh, have power at those, at those assets. Uh, we also uh, <clears throat> do Ball County School Board. We work real hard on getting Wednesday morning Every uh, Duval County School Board facility had power and was ready to, to, they were ready to then. That supports their ability to begin damage assessment and restoration within those assets. Of course, we all know school actually started back in Duval County yesterday, but we had power on Wednesday. Another uh, thing we do with, with uh, Lyman is we support the cities, uh, kind of call it cut and toss. So initially it's JFRD and then it's the public works. They get out there and try to clear the loads. That's fine, they could do that until they run up against power lines all intertwined with the, uh, with the, uh, with the, with the trees, which is common. So we embed a, line, a, a alignment or two with each of those crews to support that. So that's all going on in the initial, initial restoration days. Once we're done with our priority circuit, we basically put a, a team of multiple crews led by a JEA foreman on every one of our 330 uh, distribution circuits. So we've picked up a lot of the system already from the priority work. We, we, we go to the substation, we have 330 circuits, we ride and find and fix everything we can on every one of those circuits. That takes, so uh, we've probably had about 70 active circuits being worked over time, so you do the math on 70 into 300, it took us a couple days. We finished up that work Sunday morning, early. From there we move into more of a normal operations where we're uh, taking phone calls and we're working tickets and we, uh, we're actually continuing to, 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 to work through some tickets uh, today. Uh, so that's where we're at. Uh, so Irma, just in summary, we had uh, 280,000 customers affected, about 60% of our customers. The, the, the flip side of that is 40% of our customers, almost 200,000 customers had perfect power throughout a hurricane. So that's significant, uh, at, uh, attributable to our good work over the last decade on storm hardening, our good work on asset management, <coughs> excellent quality work by our 2,000 employees, uh, particularly those working in the, in the TND area. <coughs> Just a heads up, well, uh, not so much from a JA perspective, but, but from a state perspective, <coughs> there will be significant debate in, uh, in the state in the coming months and weeks around storm hardening and did it work. Uh, a couple of our peers to the south have done a lot with storm hardening and, and have had a hard hard hit and having a hard time coming back. Uh, we will, of course, hear the, uh, can't you underground everything, isn't that better? So just a heads up, we're not going to spend any time on that this morning, but just uh, we have done a lot in the past decade on storm hardening. Uh, we support undergrounding, but it's an expensive uh, proposition, and there's a, there's a uh, city ordinance that, that supports it on a community by community basis. Uh, we have a number of active projects, but uh, just, just a heads up for the for the board's benefit. There's likely to be significant debate during the coming uh, months on that. We have it every time there's a, there's a big hit, and this was a huge hit for the state of Florida. Uh, and that uh, concludes my report. We'll over to Brian. We'll move to uh, water wastewater. Uh, the systems were stressed. There were stress tests last year at Hurricane uh, Matthew. There were stress tests uh, last week at um, Hurricane Armour, September 10, 2007. They probably last stressed like this 
53 years ago, September 10, 1964, Hurricane Dora. And put in context, the Butman Wastewater Treatment Plant was built in 1960 when online. That's when the city had centralized sewer. And so where have we gone in the last 57 years? We have 11 wastewater treatment plants, 1,400 pump stations. Uh, still have not found anyone in America with more pump stations than us. Uh, arguably with the pump station transmission lines of 8,000 mile pipes, we're arguably the most complex transmission pump station um, system in the country, especially on the wastewater side. People who have more complicated plants, but from that perspective of the flat area, wide 850, 900 square miles we have in Jacksonville, very complicated. Uh, 37 water plants, 137 wells, and a reclaim system. So what we did was pre-planned. We bunkered down people at the four grids on our wastewater system. Rather than being centralized just at one plant, all around town we have four major grids where people bunker down, anywhere from 15 to 25 staff. Um, and we call it sleep. They went through the storm, and we'll, we'll bring up a couple of heroes here that stood up during the middle of the storm at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning and went out and repaired things to make sure we mitigated any situations or overflows. We, uh, Monday night, 6 p.m. was the peak. We had 350 ops teams out working. They've been working since daybreak. Some might have been out at 7 in the morning, some at 9 in the morning, whenever it was safe to drive in that localized area. And we had uh, mutual aid. You know, Florida was stressed, so mutual aid came more the next day. Uh, and the mutual aid <coughs> limited. We're here because everyone in Florida had challenges. Maybe about 30 people were mutual aid on the water sewer side. 850 pump stations out of 14 were out of power at 6 p.m. 7 of 11 wastewater tree plants were out of power on generators. There were some challenges a few minutes, the generators were working, but some good people here helped, helped repair that in the middle of the night. 21 of our 37 water treatment plants, out of power. 15 of those 21 are on generators. Fortunately, the water system is gridded, so we managed to keep it, uh, everything running. We had five main breaks that night. And we won't talk about the water system because there's really nothing to talk about. It, it ran near perfect, it was magnificent. We had uh, 1,300 boil water advisories out South Ponder Vigil Beach area. And we all know what happened to that you know, treasure road we have in Northeast Florida. We had 30 customers in Grove Park on an outage of boil water with these massive, beautiful oak trees uprooted the pipe. And we had a couple service breaks around town. So water system, we're kind of done talking about it. It was invisible, and that was great. So we'll talk about the sewer system. The operation team um, implemented dozens of significant direct actions over last year from what we learned from Hurricane Matthew. Um, lessons learned. We had hundreds of incremental actions that probably would never get written in a report. We have in our systems that staff have done little things. Each plant really took it to heart in the last year what we learned from Hurricane Matthew. We, uh, we had help. The electric team did a great job in last year of targeted tree removal. I'm not going to use any strategic vegetation management terms here. We looked at pump stations. If a tree was going to fall on a pump station, what can we do to take it out so it wouldn't happen during a storm? Great work on Mike's team. Uh, we, we did restoration coordination. If we really needed a particular pump station or critical waste or treat plant during a middle of storm, after hospitals, after police, right there with schools, we turn on a few super major pump stations. The Environmental Public Affairs conducting a CBOM assessment. Uh, next month, Paul Steinbrecher and I will come up with Mike's group and talk about our CBOM assessment that we worked on, in addition to direct actions, looking at a long term. It's like an audit of our system we'll talk more about next month. The communication events, Mike Hightower update. Um, we developed plans and we worked them diligently throughout the year. The finance and logistics, we expanded our generator or diesel pumps. We really like diesel pumps, folks. Uh, we, I've learned generators are somewhere between a lawnmower and a pressure washer. They're great, but they don't always work. <laughs> right? <laughs> and um, I got about an hour break the other day. I came home about day eight. My wife wanted me to get the pressure washer working. And I remember what it's. If it hasn't ran in a while, it's not easy. <laughs> and our growth, we had at least 30 generators during that two-day run that had to be repaired on the spot. We had good support from our, uh, our service provider and a lot of folks in here uh, fix things themselves. Um, we went from 320 to 480 portable units, but we still have 14 our pump stations. Insurance. Uh, Mike and our board chair have instincts with insurance. We, uh, we know the resume's there. They, they, uh, Mike's idea convinced us to list, lease 100 generators. That was a timely insurance policy, very timely. It was instrumental, allow us to, to, the second tier pump stations to be covered. And we can't count on 100, but we probably count on 93 of those, or 94 of those working. And allowed us to focus on the large ones, to mitigate any large spills. But the highlighted performance represented by six members of the team and dozens of hundreds of others of whatever call of duty. So I asked six of the water wastewater team were here. Lee and Alan and Brandon, you guys step up, and Derek. Greg, these are some six people. <laughs> here. Um, Alan and uh, 
West Mr. Zufall, they camped out in a bunker at Holly Road by Pops, Pottsburg. We had a Hurricane 5 uh, bunker brought in, and they lived together for how many hours? Long night. <laughs> <laughs> and we had to go out and retrieve them because when the river was rising, the trees were blocking it. We had to go get them, and there were trees blocking. They cut themselves out, but they stayed to watch that pump station all night long. About two or three hours, they did not go out. So they get, we'll look at the controls in case something happened. We had uh, Brandon Shaw. He's in a boat picture, 118th Street. Unfortunately, we've heard about 118th Street. We are rebuilding that station. Okay. Instead of cutting that off, we waited through that flood rising, and he monitored it with the team out there west, uh, southwest to say, if it raised a little bit higher, it's going to ruin our... That's, that's the boat right there. There he is. If it went too high... <laughs> and take a picture of that. We'll talk about lead in a minute here. That's lead in the middle of the pump station. But if it went too high, it was going to ruin our, our control center. But we wanted to keep it running, so we waited to the last minute. We didn't have to shut the pumps off. McMillan Pump Station, 14 million gallons a day, about a mile west from um, um, 95 at, at 13th Street. And Lee Heathall was out there at midnight driving back to Cedar Bay with his co-worker, repairing that to make sure the pumps were running. Now, they would have left it. He wouldn't have left the place until they were running, Lee told me. I kept on asking, what happens if you wouldn't do that, Brian? We would have got the pumps running. But it was very dangerous. Um, they did it safely. They, um, they said they want people to see them on the road with JSO, I believe. And uh, great work on that. And then Derek and Greg Daniels with a group of about 10, 12 people went out at 3.30 in the morning in the middle of the storm and repaired. We had two generators at the Man and Wastewater Treatment Plant. Both failed. One was a fuel pump issue and one had a radar going, a uh, fan and radar. And they repaired it makeshift. How to repair to get those generators running to keep the wastewater treatment plant. So three systems. Mother Nature just took over. So great job by the team. I'll try to wrap it up here real quick. Um, where we're going next year is uh, we stress test, like I said, two years in a row. We will uh, continue to work on a multi-year plan to fortify and upgrade our system. We, we titled that framework of resiliency. Our next step is to push and pull the engineering and construction industry throughout the country. Because they've got the capacity, but they've been resting on their laurels. How to design systems so we don't need heroes 10, 20 years from now. Design it, to fortify it to make sure what we as stakeholders, we as utility operators envision to be, and we're going to take to the next generation, and we'll be a leader at JA across the nation on this. But it will take some time to get it where we don't need heroes. All right? Okay, boss? Thanks, Brian. Good job. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Mike, um, we, that's my fault. We were going to introduce everybody in the back, too, but we do have um, some outstanding from individuals from Electric. Uh, Chris, why don't you stand up and introduce the... Guys, to your right. To be honest, with you, I can't introduce everybody. Here. Some of them I haven't worked with. Before. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Chris Richards. I'm a foreman at West Side Service Center. It's my boss, Matt Stafford. He's one of our coordinators. Kept us moving the whole time. Uh, Burr Sparks. And I met a couple of these fellows walking in the room. Some of them came up behind me as apprentices. So I don't know from South Side. They always said that West Side and South Side is two different utilities. And it really isn't. When it comes to people, it kind of is. Shout out. I apologize. Shout out. Stand up, say your name. President Mann. President Mann. And I met him earlier. Lance Caster. And I yeah. apologize again. Mr. Thanks Sparks for, had the privilege of working with the mayor out in the field. He did a great yeah, job. Bert, thank you. Did a great <laughs> job. Thanks. Nice name, too. Yeah. Mr. McElroy, who's next? That would be me. Robert. 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 Good afternoon, Robert Grocock. I'm here representing Carrie Stewart, who's up on a trip today, um, and representing her excellent team, customer experience team. A uh, customer experience team has many different roles in an emergency event. Uh, so we actually support multiple areas, as well as our normal customer experience role that we have within a, during our major event. Uh, we provide field employees to support the water and electric assessment, assessment teams, forestry team, teams, our warehousing and delivery efforts that we have during the storm, uh, we implement teams to go out into the communities in front of and with our electric restoration teams to meet with customers and to uh, deal with any questions or concerns or issues that they may have so that our electrical crews can do the main focus of what they do, which is the restoration portion of the um, restoration piece. Our digital response team, which includes uh, JEA.com and social media, they support the PIO to ensure our communications has a timely and consistent message to all of our customers. Uh, before the storm, we ensured that we followed our detailed functional response team, which all of us have, uh, each of our sections. Uh, we readied our phone systems and IVR for the messages that would need to be there. Uh, part of that included uh, setting up six additional rooms with 94 additional funds, phones to function as temporary call centers so we could respond to our customers who wanted to talk to us in person. 
Uh, we provide it for training for employees from outside the customer experience area who come in and help us to answer those phones for our customers. During the storm, we had 71 different call center, uh, call, cent uh, call center employees and their management team here over the storm to answer any questions that may come in during the storm and so that we could respond to those phone calls directly after the storm. We also have 60 field and meter crew services who run up the storm in the service center so that they'd be ready to help the electric crews with the assessments uh, as soon as the all clear was called. Our after storm response included, uh, we received over 72,000 and answered over 72,000 outage calls um, from JA employees, once again, from throughout the organization. Uh, joining our 94 call takers who normally take out each calls, we had over 184 individuals joining that staff from areas such as accounting, audit, audit technology service, electric systems, HR, commercial team, uh, both appointed and civil service. Um, throughout the over 14,000 employee hours that were spent on the phone talking with customers, uh, we provided an excellent service and positive attitude to assist customers through this difficult time. Our average wait time through this whole event was less than three minutes to talk to a live individual. So uh, we were very responsive to the phone calls coming in. Technology that supports us also performed fairly, uh, very well through this process. We had over a million views of JEA.com's outage map throughout the week, and that peaked at 433,000 people viewing that map on the Monday after the storm. Uh, during the response, we averaged 89,000 unique visits to the outage map uh, for, on a daily basis. Um, over 255,000 outage tickets were created in our system. 93% of those were through our automated systems, uh, IVR, our outage map uh, through text, which is a new function that we've put in recently, um, as well as a guest uh, option that we have now on the JA.com outage map as well. Uh, for digital media, we had a large surge in our di digital media with over 27,000 customer posts during the storm. Uh, JA created over 500 different messages to post back out, uh, dealing with multiple issues. Uh, many of the concerns from our customer, customers were uh, concerns shared across uh, much of our community. Uh, JA's Facebook generated over 83,000 engagements over the storm time period with a weekly, weekly total of uh, 683,000 uh, customers um, who had exposure to a JA Facebook post. Um, and 82% uh, of our posts that were out there were considered either positive or neutral towards the organization, which reflects the excellent uh, communication effort that we had to make sure that our customers were informed. Uh, the digital team pushed out also another additional 2.6 million customer emails throughout this uh, and before the storm to ensure that we had uh, our customers were ready and knew what to expect during our response. Um, and we also understand, though, from a customer perspective, that uh, it definitely was going to be a challenging time for them. Uh, so we suspended disconnection for non-payment, uh, we suspended late fees for our customers, uh, and we automatically extended anybody who currently had a pay plan to beyond the time in the restoration event to ensure that, uh, that we wouldn't uh, do anything negative to their account. Um, we also supported the city's response provi by providing resources to co-locate with the 630 City Call Center to answer any questions or concerns that would come directly to them from our customers. Uh, two of the main areas we focused on during the week is first customer experience's job to really provide communication both to our customers and from our customers back to the organization. Um, so we concentrated on submitting tickets both from uh, people who called us from our automated systems and uh, jointly with the list that would come over from the 630 City Call Center. Um, we also provided information on when people, uh, as well as we could, with information about our response efforts. And as soon as we were working on circuits and had that information, we would provide the, that with the customers who would call in so that we could tell them when we had crews working within their neighborhood. Um, secondly, we worked with our customer list sent over um, to make sure that we had multiple inputs to determine uh, who was in power and out of power. That included pinging our uh, technology system and our meter system to verify when power went back in for the, some of the customers that were at risk. Um, throughout the storm recovery effort, customer experience team, including the many employees who supported us, and we thank them highly for coming over and assisting in a very, very difficult time uh, on the phone. So if you can imagine being an accountant and all of a sudden having to talk to somebody for 12 hours uh, about a very, very difficult issue, many of them performed absolutely <coughs> fantastic. All of them did. Uh, and we appreciate their support. Um, and that concludes my report. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my, my uh, report will be into, into three uh, uh, categories, uh, media relations, government relations, environmental, and that is put under the thing of the uh, 
uh, public information officer that is the person that is in charge of that. Let me first talk to uh, about media relations. Uh, an important part here is prior to, uh, from last year, let me first go back to Matthew and getting ready for this, is that the media relations uh, staff, which is at JEA, are two. Um, Jerry Boyce, who of course we know is our media star, and uh, Judy Spann have spent the number of this last year uh, learning lessons learned, but spending time with the media as we were hoping that we weren't going to have another storm, but letting them know what their role and how they could be partners. I, to the board and to the media and to the public is here, uh, we cannot say thank you enough to the Jacksonville media. When you hear the statistics of 284,000 customers who do not have power, um, when you're looking for a communication <coughs> ally to help the people understand to get through this, to share hope, to share compassion, to share it's, it's all about us together, the Jacksonville media stepped up. I, they have been an incredible partner in helping this community to come back from one of the most one of the biggest tragedy ever. Had it not been for the Jacksonville media to keep everything in context, keep it balanced, we would not be here today having this report. Uh, they understood the complexity of this. They understood the magnitude of it. They also understood the communication barriers that were confronting not only us, but the Jacksonville police, the mayor's office, everyone. And they stepped up and made sure it was all about their fellow colleague. And that is one of the lessons learned that going forward, as we go forward, is uh, as Paul, you've heard Paul say, whether it's one SSO or it's one customer that doesn't get the message, it's one SSO or one customer too many. When you have a storm of this magnitude, we're going to have to rely on every possible way to communicate. I, as one, as many of you on the board know, don't even know how to spell uh, social media. Had it not been for social media and that collaboration, we wouldn't be here. Paul held starting out uh, on early Wednesday, two days after the storm, started holding uh, daily media um, briefings. And again, uh, when you start calling those things press normally, uh, they're not there every time the entire press corps of Jacksonville was there. Uh, the media relations, our, 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 our media relations star, Jerry Boyce, uh, during this, did 50 interviews on the air. We had a little bit of competition between Paul, Paul and Jerry, but Paul finally said Jerry was the winner. Uh, we became state, local, and national. We, we were picked up uh, by virtue of what happened in South Florida and by virtue of what was here in Jacksonville. Um, Irma became, Jacksonville became the epicenter for what was going on uh, beside, it was us in Key West. So Paul and Jerry sort of kept the, the entire country apprised of all that. Um, the media folks uh, were over 100 uh, inquiries on a daily basis. Um, the uh, media staff allowed, uh, thanks to Mr. Sparks, we, uh, he wanted, the mayor was very interested in being a part of our community. He wanted to go to one of those areas. He wanted to see what our linemen were doing. We took him out in the Arlington area. Uh, Mr. Sparks put him up in, in, a, um, in a bucket. I don't know what that conversation was like. The mayor was real glad to get down from that bucket. Um, but he also saw the incredible uh, is the, the devastation of what it did, and that really made a difference. It, made, it was huge. It, again, uh, the press saying we're all in that together, and that's what they did. Government relations, um, the team led by uh, Jordan and Nancy, kept our state, local, and, and uh, uh, federal congressional members, but also the, the governor, kept them apprised every day of what was going on. You can imagine in some of our, our city council districts, some were more hurt than others, but the one thing was, and that was the other thing that came through, is uh, city seeing our elected officials on the city council, if, they, if their district wasn't so hurt, they were over there giving moral support to their colleagues saying, what can I do? And seeing our city councilmen out there, city council women out there with the linemen saying, what can I do? Uh, we'll, we'll let you know is that they wore their jackets, they had safety, we made sure of that. Uh, so there were no incidents of elected officials being hurt during this time. Um, the, the other thing is that we had a number of city and elected officials, city council members come into the EOC. 
again, we're all in this together. You can imagine when you have, you have gone 24 hours for four or five days, you can imagine whether we say it or not, fatigue sets in. To have these elected officials come in there, talk to the folks, not only in the field, but at the EOC who are spending that time, that is the kind of motivation that says, I can do it one more hour, I can do that. And so we say thank you to the elected officials. Um, the other part, and, I, and again, uh, you know, he doesn't like to hear it, but the relationship that, that Paul has uh, developed with our governor. The governor was on the phone. Every day, Paul had a conversation with the governor or the governor's staff. On more than one occasion, the governor either li li reached out to him or one of us to say, what is it that you need? What can I do? He gave us a point person during this storm. You tell us what we need. What can we do? Um, Paul will talk about uh, when the media and everybody asked him, when are you going to get done? I'll let Paul tell you how, how he responded. Um, but it was, it was a collaborative effort all the way down. Environmental, you've already heard from Brian. I, I, let me tell you, board members and Mr. Chairman, um, the resiliency plan that Brian and his team put together following Matthew has been extraordinary. And let me tell you why that was extraordinary. As you all remember, we had a number of SSOs during that storm. You all, you don't have to tell, I don't have to tell you about what this storm looked like. The media showed what downtown looked like, what the west side, the north side, the flooding that was all over. I can tell you, thanks to the environmental team that I have the privilege of working with, the following things. Thanks to the great work that Brian and his team and the environmental and the relationship with DEP. They are professional but they were here on the ground with us. Let me give you a couple. There were no incidents of oil spills, chemical spills, or releases at any of our facilities, thanks to the great work that had been done with the collaboration of Mike and Brian. There were only two boil water advisories out of the entire distribution system, and it impacted 1,323 customers. As Paul always says, that's 1,323 customers, too many. But that's all. Written notification, the DEP could not have been a better partner uh, along with the governor. Given the magnitude of this, there were only 59 SSOs that were written and put there and are still being tested. Ladies and gentlemen, I am happy to report, thanks to the great work of Brian and his team, out of 843 million gallons of water that went through our sewer systems, 2.3 million gallons are the only that were the SSOs, and that is thanks to the great work. And that comes, I am not a mathematician, as many of you know, but that is 0.30% of the water that went through our system that we had. And I can tell you that thanks to the incident, uh, incident response team that worked with Brian's team, I can honestly say that about at least half of that was captured, was treated, but was captured and taken care of. And that concludes my, my thing. And, and just, again, we understand the mayor's thing about communicate, communicate. We take that away. We are going to start tomorrow working with the media. We're going to be working with all the agencies. As Paul always says, one customer that doesn't understand is one customer too many. But I will tell you, lessons learned, but I will tell you the collaborative effort, the coordinated effort, the we're going to do this together, not only from this JE team and the men and women that you see out here, but from the people that spent, and until yesterday, had spent um, a week in a windowless uh, place, not knowing what's going on. Uh, I, shared a, I shared a comment with the managing editor of the Times Union, and I think this goes to the importance of the collaboration of Jacksonville. And I shared with her the importance of the importance of having balanced and uh, objective reporting. When you have men and women out in the field who don't know what's going on, and when you have people in an EOC or in a place that don't know what's going on, their only understanding of what is going on is the media. And when you have the media helping people to understand what is going on, and it's done in a balance that it's two, you can have two responses from the people who are being impacted who are helping you get out of the storm are those people who are there waiting. You can say, we're going to get this together in encouragement, or it can be you've got a foot on their neck and they don't know how to do it. I thank them for doing the former. We were in it together. That concludes my report.
Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Hightower. Mr. Paul? Mr. Chairman, I'll do my best to be brief. Uh, as the Chief Information Officer, I run the Technology Services Organization. We have two main responsibilities in events like this, communications and systems. In the communications aspect, we perform, they perform very well. We have radios, cell phones, wireless devices, field laptops, satellite phones, fiber connections, and a meter network that almost work effectively during and after the storm, and they all did. And during the entire storm, we had one down cable and one tower outage and a number of lost meter connections, but there was any, never any disruption to the business because of inherent redundancy of, the, of our systems. I'm also going to add, based on the comment Paul made earlier, that we're lucky with this building. Uh, it's the central point for most of our fiber communications and also the radio system, which is actually operated by the city of Jacksonville. Radio systems are used not only by ourselves, but also by JSO and JFRD. And the central service for that uh, radio system are up on the 18th floor of this building and uh, are going to be needed to be relocated since the plans are eventually will be to uh, we locate out of this building. So that's a, a major effort that we have to tackle in the future. Uh, systems also performed well. Uh, we use systems that are best in the industry. We use Landerson Gear, as, which is the number one meter company for all our automated meters. We use CGI for our field management system, or which we'll refer to later as the FMS system. And that's used by many other electric utilities, including two of our neighbors here, Tico and OUC and Oracle for our customer care and billing system, as well as our back office systems. In total, we have 130 people on our staff supporting our systems and communications. So the most important system during a storm is the field management system. It's a complex system that has two critical components. It's the outage management system, or OMS, which gathers and organizes all the outage information from either the customer or from our electric grid, and the computer-aided dispatch system, which helps manage all the field work orders and gathers data about completions. It's a main way we know when someone is back in service, uh, but we also like to ping the meter to ensure that the customer has in fact been energized. So all this information drives our outage map, uh, which unfortunately, as I think the mayor stated earlier, was a source of some customer confusion. Uh, the map's intended to display areas of the city that are experiencing outages, outages not individual customers widely used by the media and others to understand overall disruptions in the system. If customers want to see the status of their own account, though they are advised to sign into their account and check it that way. Unfortunately, because it's easier for them to just look at the map, since it doesn't require them to sign in, they use the map to check their individual stat status, which is not really what the map is designed to do. So as Robert described, more and more people are accessing our systems uh, via mobile devices percent was actually at one point during the storm over 95 percent. We recently upgraded the mobile system so that the customer would be able to access the same information on their mobile devices as they would on their home PCs or via a call to our call center. So even if they had no power they were able to uh, contact our systems which frankly is a good thing. So in the future we need to be able to prove how we present their information to them working on a project that will use the, their meter to actually give us that information in the future. And this will be a major enhancement once we can address some of the challenges of that new approach and how we get the outage information together. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Costco. Good afternoon. I'm reporting out today on behalf of the section chiefs for the finance section and logistics section. Um, while we're bringing up some photos I'd like to share with you on the logistics, uh, I'm just going to give a quick, quick overview of where we are from a financial perspective uh, resulting from the storm. Um, our damage estimate from Hurricane Irma is about $30 million. Um, that is substantially greater than the damage that we had from Hurricane Matthew. Uh, Hurricane Matthew, our system uh, had about $20 million in, in damage. Um, we are uh, expecting to be reimbursed for the vast majority of that $20 million, and we do expect to be reimbursed for the vast majority of the $30 million that we sustained during Hurricane Irma. Uh, the net cost to JEA of Hurricane Matthew was about $2 million, and we expect something similar for, uh, for net cost from Hurricane Irma. We have also been fielding some questions from uh, investors and rating agencies about the impact to our system from the storm, and those questions have largely been bucketed into two areas. One is how much damage was there to our system, um, to the power plants and to the, the system infrastructure itself. Um, <coughs> and the second area was what is the lost revenue going to mean for our financial position for this year. 
Uh, fortunately, we've been able to reassure um, our investor community that um, the damage to the system was manageable and the vast majority is expected to be reimbursed. Um, and in particular, there, the highlight um, of that answer is our liquidity position, which again further reinforces the, the value of, of having that liquidity on hand to our investors. Um, and then how rapidly we were able to restore electric service to, to the vast majority of our customers. Um, and so from a revenue perspective, we don't expect any material talent challenges either. Um, I'll share with you just a couple of photos. Oops. Let's go through I got my back to it. Sorry. Uh -oh. um, all right. Do I have control? Okay. I'm going to talk while we're, <laughs> we're waiting for, for pictures. On the logistics side, uh, we, we effectively stood up an organization that was a military scale organization. And in order for us to have the number of workers that we had come into Jacksonville and work effectively, um, we had to make sure that the logistics were seamless uh, to be able to get them the materials and supplies that they needed, the transportation that they needed, um, and to be able to restore uh, quickly and effectively. Um, the, uh, can you pass Next. just one? There you go. Thank you. Um, so it begins with preparation. We, at the beginning of storm season, model our system and we stock up our inventory to be able to respond to, to damage that we would expect to have to our system from a Category 1 hurricane. Uh, we had all of those materials and supplies on hand. These are some photos from our uh, large warehouse operation out on Commonwealth uh, prior to the storm. Um, and that helped ensure that we were able to respond um, from a materials and supplies perspective. Um, as we saw that storm approaching us, we also requested and received in additional materials ahead of the storm to provide us some additional safety margin um, so that we, we could eliminate the risk that we were going to run out of any, uh, any materials that were needed to, to ensure restoration. Uh, this gives you a sense for the, the scale of mutual aid and contract workers that we had in, and this actually isn't even the peak. Uh, we had more workers that were out at Morocco Shrine uh, helping us with restoration. Uh, and because of the number of mutual aid and contract workers, we actually had to set up another warehouse operation out at Morocco Shrine, and we did it in about a day, um, which was uh, substantially um, impactful in terms of being able to get folks out into the field. Uh, this just gives you some more photos of that temporary warehouse location that we set up at Morocco Shrine. And what the workers out there would do um, is, is drive through that warehouse and kit up their trucks for the day um, as they were leaving to go out. Um, and work in the field. And this is just some photos of the, the lanes that were set up around that warehouse to be able to get those uh, workers out quickly. Um, now, during the storm, one of the things that we combated in terms of misinformation was rumors around uh, lack of availability of supplies and transformers in particular. Um, during the storm, we were never in danger of running out of transformers. Um, we used 405 transformers already in the restoration in Irma, which is a lot more than we used during Matthew. Matthew, we used 327, but we've still got 90. Um, so we've got plenty of transformers on hand to be able to complete this restoration work. Um, our uh, CEO was kind enough to help us try to put to bed some of these rumors um, by uh, taking a selfie in front of <laughs> some pallets of transformers um, to help dispel the rumors that we were running out of transformers. <laughs> so we appreciate his help with correcting that, that misinformation. We <laughs> yeah, not good with selfies. Good evidence so far. Yeah, that was key. That was key. Um, in addition to inventory, though, our logistics team was responsible for ensuring smooth operation of this army of workers that we brought in. Um, they worked with 12 different hotels, providing 9,168 bed nights uh, during the restoration. We partnered with JTA uh, on eight buses, transporting 400 crew members twice a day. We provided 30,000 meals. Um, to workers that were out in the field doing restoration and did everything from arranging laundry um, to other types of logistical things to keep these, these workers functioning um, and complete restoration as quickly as we could. Um, we also helped to coordinate the um, helicopter um, that helped us do damage assessment as quickly as we could. Um, that concludes my report. Thank you, Ms. Knight. I think I'm up next. Okay, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Board of Directors. Um, during our declared recent emergency, Hurricane Irma, Human Resources operated 24-7 along with the rest of the organization. We provide operational support throughout the organization by deploying our employees in areas where they, in some cases, have never worked is very different from their normal blue sky reporting structure. While at the same time, we want to make sure that we're leaving a staff on board to be able to support our managers and our employees. 
We do that in a number of ways, but I'm just going to highlight just a few of those to give you an <laughs> idea of the type of support that we provide. One of the things that's very important as we go through this event is to make sure that we're in constant contact with our management and our employees. And we do that a number of ways. We have a very close-knit partnership with our communication department, and we communicate with our employees and our managers via email, by special alerts. Um, we have hotline numbers set up for our employees. One of the things that was really significant about the information hotline, as we had employees who did heed the mayor's warning and evacuate, we wanted to make sure that they were able to connect with their managers in the organization to make sure that they were able to return to work, knowing when to return to work, and also how to get in contact with their manager. Something that we also provide, because we know that once we're in full restoration mode, it is all hands on deck, all boots on the ground. We provide an employee assistance program. This program allows employees, for whatever reason, that they're not able to return to work because of something that's going on at home. And to give you some examples of those, we've had employees who've had significant tree damage at their home, trees blocking their driveway, so there's no way for them to get their vehicle out to come to work. Um, we have a crew that goes over to help them remove that debris, move those trees, so that they can get their vehicle out to come to work. We have employees who were in areas that were flooded, and because of the level of their car, the low profile vehicles, an employee would have been in significant danger or safety issues, or perhaps even lost their vehicle if they had tried to use their vehicle to come to work. So we would then deploy a, a vehicle with, that is a higher profile vehicle with larger tires, larger vehicle, to provide a ride for that employee to come to work. And in some cases, when an employee has had damage to their home, in order to help that employee secure their home and then come into work, we provided tarps and other materials to help them to secure that. One of the things that also worked very well for us doing this, and this was a lot of preparation beforehand, knowing what resources we already had available in our organization, and that is our EAP, or Employee Assistance Program through Health Advocates. One of the things that we know for sure that when we ever have events like this, it is a stress on our community. It's also a stress on our employees. And we want to make sure that we have different coping and stress management practices in place to help us through these difficult times. We have people come on site to set up different conference rooms to meet with employees. We employ people out into the field to make sure that they're working with our individuals. And also because we are cognizant of the fact that we have workers who are out in the field we provide information to them to connect with the counselor at their own leisure or whenever they get a chance or when they feel the need to do so. And because we know that many families are left alone while our workers are here providing services to their community, we make that accessible to their family members as well. One of the things that we also keep in mind and is very paramount, safety is important to us here every single day, but there's an extra emphasis that's placed on that when we're working in conditions that are very different when we have severe weather, we have winds, we had flooding. We deploy our safety technicians out to the field. They're working with our crews. Um, they actually go out and meet with some of our mutual aid crews. While we know they have their own safety protocol, their own safety practices, we want to make sure that they're working in conjunction with our crews and the safety protocol that we use here. One of the things that we did differently this year as it related to safety and making sure that our employees um, we're working more safely as well as providing just a little additional support. Um, we have an industrial trainer who works with our employees on stretching, making sure that their muscles are not getting too tight, having them go out in the field, observe our employees, where they saw where an employee might have been getting a little fatigued, being able to work with them to encourage them to take a short break just to be rejuvenated. Also, because we have people, again, who are working in jobs that they have never worked before, sometimes sitting for long periods of time can cause cramping, can cause fatigue. We actually had someone come in and take them through some stretching exercises, which really um, helps employees stay a little bit rejuvenated and more, more relaxed and, and alert. One of the things that I will say is that our JEA employees work very, very hard, but we watch them give their all during this recent event. We saw people leave their families and put aside their own needs to make sure that our customers were served. And while I could give you a number of stories of some of the things that took place with our employees, there are three th particular stories that comes to mind that I think they were very emotional and touching for me, and I want to just share those briefly with you. One employee that comes to mind, and I will give no names, 
This employee lost everything that he had. When he reported to work after the storm, water was up to the roof of his house. He lost his house, he lost his car, he lost his truck, he lost his boat, and he lost his pet. And when we would typically think to seek sanctuary with a relative, his father's house was also underwater. This employee reported to work and his words were, I have a community to serve. That is the heart of a true public servant. We had an employee who only 90 days after moving into a new home had a tree hit the top of her house. Water began to pour in. This employee came to work. This employee consoled a customer on the phone who talked about a tree falling on their house and giving that employee, that customer some advice. That is the heart of a true public servant. And probably the most touching story of all, last year we had an employee that was injured almost to the point of death. But that employee put that thought aside, put that family need aside, and was right out there working hours and hours to make sure that power was restored to our community. That is the true spirit of JEA. That is the true spirit and the heart of a public servant. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Yeah. Well, board members, we've tried to give a, 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 a complete assessment right now, just a few moments uh, after the event, uh, as we start to wind down and move into normal. I'm sorry. N normal operations. Uh, a couple of key things to, to mention or to note that uh, the water sewer folks there's no mutual aid in water sewer and essentially did that and had that performance we had a few folks come in late in the game i think totaled uh 40 40 or 50 we had them for a day or two and and, and they were helpful but there really is no system of support there what was done there was done by the the j18 um you know sometimes we get focused and obsessed on a on an outage map and a piece of data and this is real people real lives on both sides um, our team was absolutely extraordinary and I feel a sense of uh, admiration I'm 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 completely astonished at the performance and the the care and nurturing for one another and and all I can say is and, and it sounds almost trivial this was an unbelievable team effort it was a complete and total commitment to restoration on behalf of everyone who worked tirelessly to get our community back. I have the highest esteem and honor for the individuals I work with and the individuals that work with them. I respect them, I thank them, and I wish them Godspeed as we all try now to take a deep breath and, and recover ourselves and spend some time with our, our family uh, and, and get ourselves prepared to re-enter life. This is a, a significantly emotional time for everyone on the JA team that has been working so hard and, and, and long. And um, I thank you for your time and coming in and today and, and hearing uh, the reports. I have um, and appreciate your support through this process as well. I have two two things that uh, maybe we um, Jesse, where are you out there? Jesse, we miss Jesse who who did a fantastic job on the line and uh, helped us out tremendously. Thank you very much, buddy. Yes, um, and uh, I think we'd be remiss if uh, our our council liaison, Council Schellenberg, had had sort of a view from uh, the the city council and 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 his and and maybe Dr. Daphne and and I just turn it back over to the board and thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McRoy, and uh, thanks to the entire senior leadership team. Uh, it's impossible to overstate uh, the commitment uh, that each and one, each and every one of you, uh, and all of those in your departments have made to our community. I thank Ms. Irons for sharing those uh, anecdotes, uh, stories of just a few of the individuals at JEA uh, who put uh, service to their community and our customers ahead of their own uh, families and their own homes coming into the work. Uh, while their uh, homes and families were in peril. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's incredible. Uh, there's just really no words uh, to express uh, the gratitude uh, for myself, uh, for this board, and for all of our uh, customers, for all that, uh, all that you guys did. So I appreciate you guys who are in the audience uh, and all, that, uh, all your colleagues that you represent. Thank you.
that way, any questions for the senior leadership team at this time? Uh, I have a question and maybe an observation, Chairman. I can't agree with you more on your your comments and assessment. Um, we're all fairly competitive in this room. Everybody in this room is competitive, and we'd like to know how we how we stand uh, when we're competing. At some point in time, I'm sure there's going to be some kind of measuring between our utility and other utilities in the state or our, our uh, county and other counties in the state. Not sure we'd like to see that. But I have a feeling we're going to be right at the top. I, I think that's going to be something that we can have an opportunity to celebrate again. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure, who, sure whose job that is, but I'd like to, to uh, ask that that be part of our responsibility here in the, in the next uh, month or so. Um, yeah, just a kind of a housekeeping thing, Mr. Chairman. You know, the previous administration uh, went through a hurricane, and, and one of the things one of the things we did as a board that I thought was pretty pretty smart, one of the, well, not one of the few things, but one of the many things that we did as a board, um, was that we had one spokesperson for the board, and I'm not sure we need any any real debate or discussion on that, but it, I think it would be appropriate if we did confirm that the chairman of the board does speak for the board. Uh, in this matter, and there's a lot of there's a lot of reporters in the room, and a lot of interest in the in the uh, subject. So uh, I don't know where we need to take that, but I would like to offer that we we consider that as our our uh, procedure again in this incident. Thank you, Mr. Petway. I think <laughs> you can do it, Mr. Petway. Yeah, I didn't ask. I really didn't ask for any discussion. <laughs> <laughs> no question, Ms. Kessler. I would just like to really follow on, on these two guys' words that were spot on to say how important it is for us. And I don't want to get emotional, like Ms. Hires makes me emotional with the stories, <laughs> but how important it is for us to look in your eyes. Because, I mean, we were out there worrying about you, praying for you, doing all those things. But you're the guys and women who did it. So thank you. It makes me feel very proud to be part of this organization. And thank you for being here today. Well said. Reverend Newbill. Uh, yes, I want to first of all concur with uh, Mr. Petway. I, I think it uh, provides clarity right. when we have one voice from the board. And so he and I both point to you. And I just want to agree with uh, everyone else because you know, we know it was a Herculean job. Uh, when you talk about 200 plus thousand, uh, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of homes. Uh, we know the devastation that took place, and we know that you were out there. You, you know, you were not watching it like some of us by way of television and uh, iPad, but you were out there. And so, along with the other board members, I just want to commend you, and uh, it really makes me proud to be a board member on JEA. Thank you. Mr. Cumber. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I will, I'll echo what everybody said. I, I was thinking about what, you know, one word kind of describes this, you know, last 10 days. And um, I think it's, you know, it's wow, right? We had a, we had a storm that, um, <clears throat> you know, I'd say at least personally, <laughs> I'd speak for myself, you know, when the storm was as far as it, as it was and people were preparing, right? I mean, a lot of us are just used to you know, are we preparing too soon? Are we, you know, are we making people focus on, on, on a storm that may or may not impact us? Um, the fact is the professionals knew, um, you know, you guys prepared, but what, what I will, what I will mention, which I think is the most, um, you know, important thing from my perspective is, you know, the folks out there in the field, um, like they have a job, but <clears throat> the, I think we have to recognize that they were the front for the customers, um, and they did an amazing job, and I just want to commend them for that because <clears throat> they were tired, um, they were stressed, but they talked to every customer that walked up to them. Mm -hmm. So, congratulations! Thank you, Mr. Cumber. Um, I, I do want to uh, say that uh, just as with Matthew, uh, where we implemented the resiliency plan. Uh, there are things that we can improve on here. There are lessons to be learned. 
additional steps that we can take to uh, reduce the impact to our customers the next time this happens. Uh, we live in Florida. Um, you know, uh, the, water, the, the tide's going to rise and the wind's going to blow. And uh, this wasn't the last uh, hurricane we're going to have uh, impact our um, customer service area. So let's learn from this. Uh, in particular, I'm sensitive to the observations of the mayor. Um, Mr. Cosgrave, Mr. Grocock, you and Ms. Stewart uh, get together and figure out why we're giving bad information. Um, we shouldn't be uh, subjecting our customers uh, to bad information. If they're misreading an outage map, let's do a better job of communicating that. Um, let's continue to harden those systems and looking uh, at ways to uh, reduce the SSOs next time, reduce the uh, tree limbs down. I mean, there's, there's just room for growth uh, and improvement. Uh, you've done it before. You continue to do it every day. Uh, let's redouble our efforts and continue them. With that, meeting adjourned. Talk to you.